Hey everybody, Dr. Marshall Lemoyne with PhysioU, and today for the teaching table, we're going to be talking about ACL re-tears. More importantly, how can we try to prevent re-tears? I'm here with two doctoral students, two third years from a DPT program, Cameron and Chris. Thanks for joining, guys. Um, and we like to start out just having them ask some questions, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So I'm wondering just what are the movements that are most related to re-tears? Because I've never seen a patient long enough to have them come back in, so I'm just wondering what does the research say? Um, well, the nice thing is the, the research about ACLs and re-tears is there's lots of it, lots and lots of it, right? It's very, uh, it's researched often and a lot because there's so much money involved with sports. And if you lose someone for eight, nine, ten months, you want to make sure you don't lose them again. Um, or more importantly, can we not lose them at all in the first place? So, um, so the nice thing is when you say what evidence is it, there's a lot. And the evidence that says how do you prevent re-tears uh, is very similar to how do you prevent tears in the first place, these non-contact tears. So the nice thing is... Um, it's, it's not like there's this new subset of it. It's the same stuff, right? And so um, if I go kind of to the PowerPoint, I pulled up an article that looked at re-tears. Um, and there's 8% re-tears a year, or 8% of people re-tear. It's a little bit higher in the pros, so 12% re-tear in the pros. Um, it's even more common in females, right? So if uh, the research says one out of four girls that tear their ACL is going to re-tear that same leg or the opposite leg. So they're going to go have, they're going to have another ACL tear in their body, one of the other legs, um, one out of four. That's a high number, 25%. That's crazy. Um, and so the studies say you can kind of limit it to, or you can narrow down the four risk factors that put people at risk to re-tear for these non-contact ACL. And the reason why we say non-contact is because if someone slams into your knee and, I mean, just things happen, whether you are the strongest, best motor control, um, right, your bike can only handle so much of an awkward torque from somebody else. So the top four would be just hip rotation control. So their knee diving in, their femur rotating in. Like the same things we talk about with people who have their first ACL tear, or, or if you're in these pre-ACL programs, like the Santa Monica or these prep ones, that they're trying to go to these like soccer teams and basketball teams and like try to prevent girls from tearing them in the first place. It's the same thought. Keep the femur from rotating inward. Good control. The second one, is in the frontal plane. So instead of the transverse is the rotation, it's the frontal plane, which is the adduction of the hip. So the first two are all about, can we keep the leg from going into adduction and internal rotation, which puts stress on the ACL graft. The third one is um, sagittal plane strength. So quad and hamstring strength, right? Do they have enough strength to sustain landing on one leg? Can their quad do the work? If their quad can't, their leg is going to go somewhere, right? Um, and then the fourth one is if we move up the chain to uh, the trunk, and they kind of call it postural control. So when you stand on one leg, where does your weight fall, right? If you're leaning more lateral, right, your trunk leans lateral, the weight falls outside of your knee, which is very similar to your knee diving inward under your trunk. So it's the center of mass. Can we keep that over a little bit inside of their leg, right? And those are kind of the four big ones they talked about to prevent re-tears, which are very similar to preventing tears in the first place. Good question. Yeah. And my question to follow up with that is, what is the current research uh, showing um, related to the various graphs that are offered? Good. Um, yeah, so now what used to be kind of like um, two different types of graphs. You had your allograft and your autograft. And if you had an autograft, was it your hamstring or your patella tendon, right? Those are kind of the things. Now they have like quad graphs. They use the opposite side. They're starting to use stuff from the ankle. So there's a lot of different ones, but um, the research that I know about is more about the main ones. Um, and it is, uh, you always want to try to have an autograft, less, less failure rates in general, just because it's come, something coming from your own body, right? Um, however, sometimes it's a little bit more painful, right? And then the second thing is um, they have hamstring grafts, have twice as many re-tears as patellar tendon grafts, the bone-to-bone -bone ones, right? And um, the, the main reason why is that people, if they have a hamstring graft, they're actually able to push themselves and go a lot uh, faster and heavier early on because they don't have, their knee wasn't disrupted by having the part of their patellar tendon taken out. So they tend to have less anterior knee pain, whether it's patellofemoral, patellar tendonitis. Um, their quad seems to work a little bit better because it wasn't disrupted, right? They took it out of their hamstring and that's easier. So they are able to get back to sport a little faster. They're able to um, do a lot of these things faster when maybe the graft itself isn't really ready and so then they have re-tears versus your um, bone to bone when your patellar one, where you're a lot of times like at months four and five, when maybe your hamstring guy's working on single limb hopping and he's running, 
this person, like you're having to kind of keep it a little slower because if he does more than 40 jumps, like double jumps, his knee is sore, it's a little swelling. And so you have to bring him along a little bit slower just because of knee pain. But maybe down the line, that's actually safer for when I go back to sport. Right? Um, and that leads me to, there's a, an article I was reading that talks about the chances of re-tears. And, and the, the idea was um, they tracked these people that went back to sport and then who re-teared and kind of when did they go back, right? And there was this big drastic cutoff at nine months. The people that went back to um, sport, even though they passed everything, they passed hops test, they passed this, but they went back before nine months. I think they said like almost 34% of them had a re-tear. Versus if they waited after nine months, it was down to like a 19% of this special group of professional athletes. Um, so it's like just that nine month mark, almost like, uh, doubles. If you go before nine months, it doubles it. Um, there's another study that, took, that looked at if you wait till after a year, if you wait till after one year out, the likelihood of retears again drops significantly than those. And as they looked at it every month that you waited, the risk went down, right? So it's something to think about when we have our patient in front of us. If they are not trying to, if they are a sophomore in high school, and they're pretty much missing most of their season, and maybe they're going to try to make it back for one or two games and that's the nine month mark, you might want to think, is this really, is it worth it for those two games versus just be okay missing the season, go through the summer rehab, and then when you go back and season starts and you're out a year, your, your likelihood is making any money. Um, if maybe there's no scholarship on the line at this point, like it's, we should probably make a better decision to help them because they all want to get back and play, right? They all want to get back and play. So we can help them make that decision a little better or help them with their parents, right? Um, yeah, I think um, if we talk about what are some things we can do to make the risk lower, we talked about what were the risk factors, but in the clinic when we're treating patients, right, obviously we're working on a lot of strengthening. So it's quad strength, glute strength, calf strength, trunk strength, right? So you think at the knee, above the knee, below the knee, the trunk, all those things play a factor into why someone would re-tear. Um, we want to make sure they're, they're sufficient in all their hopping and jumping. So all your noise hops test right? Your uh, square hop testing, all those things. There's times, there's norms. We want to make sure they're there. Um, we want to practice their star excursion balance tests. There's good evidence to suggest if they are within that 94% of all the directions, less than four centimeters anterior, that decreases risk of injury. We want to make sure they practice all their cutting. So T tests, that has norms. Your pro agility tests, can they get that under five seconds? So they have all these tests that have norms that we want to make sure that we're hitting the marks of to make sure that, hey, you're going to be the lowest risk. There's never no risk, but we want to make sure you are the lowest risk possible. Um, and then once they've met all those, right, that just means in a very specific setting, you're good, right? You're, you're, you're fast enough and you're strong enough in a very isolated setting. So now we want to start practicing these other multitasks. So the same things, but now we're throwing a ball at you. We're making you count backwards. We're putting on special glasses that make it a little blurry. We're making you close your right eye and do it, right? You're doing all these things that would, they would hopefully come across in sport and say, hey, can you still perform just as good? Can you keep your same time? Can you keep your same mechanics? Can you see, keep your same quad output, right? So we want to kind of build that in, right? Um, and then the last thing would be the most, one of the most important things we tell is this neuromuscular control, right? There was a list of like four or five studies that listed that they compared neuromuscular control, so balance on one leg on an air X, balance on a BOSU ball, um, comparing it to like just normal strength training and weights and stuff. And these people had significantly better outcomes in their function, in their pain, by working on neuromuscular control. So we wanna remember that when someone has an ACL tear, it's not just this structure that needs to be worked on, it's the whole system that needs to be improved um, and so part of that is putting them through the rigors of neuromuscular control and have really good outcomes for that, right? Um, yeah. Um, and then kind of the idea is how do you prevent retears? We also want to make sure the patient's ready. Just because they pass everything on the tests, if they go back out and they're really scared and fearful, um, chances are they're not going to perform as well or they more um, they might re-injure themselves just because they're too rigid and they're not moving the way they should be moving because they're guarding, they're not letting their knee bend like it should, so they don't absorb shock well. So giving them outcome measures like a KOS or a Tampa scale, a kinesiophobia scale, those are also an important part before we send them out to play. Um, I know there's, there's a lot to ACLs. We could, you could spend, people spend week-long kind of classes on ACL stuff. 
Uh, so hopefully in a nutshell, we can say, hey, what are some of the risk factors, those four we mentioned, and what are some of the big training things? Get the norms and neuromuscular control. Um, yeah, any other kind of questions from you guys? Okay, We're good? Thank you so okay. Much. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us on the teaching table, talking about ACL retears and doing our best to prevent them. Um, take a look at all of our social media. Give us a thumbs up, a like, follow us, as well as stop by Knowledge Central on physiou.com. You'll see all of our mentoring minutes and our teaching table videos. Take care, guys. See you next time.